Hey, welcome to session number two of Grow Hall Valley's Backyard Gardeners Workshops. And uh, my name is Tapa. I work on our rural farm and also in the education department in Grow Hall Valley. So we'd like to uh, explain where we are first so you get a kind of a background of context of what we're talking about here. Um, this is called Farm 18. Farm 18 is about a all well, roughly, I'd say a quarter acre of raised beds that were constructed underneath a viaduct. If you've ever been uh, in soils underneath or the terrain under a viaduct, you know that it's very, very poor soil. It's compacted. But due to the hard work and heroics of the AmeriCorps volunteers uh, over the last five or six years, they've turned this into a green oasis. Last year, it produced about $15,000 in produce that was uh, basically distributed through the community-supported agriculture to the Catholic Neighborhood Center. A lot of it was given charitably. And the neighborhood that we're in is very interesting. This is a, this uh, viaduct or overpass roared right through a very residential blue-collar neighborhood in Wheeling. You can see some of the housing here that was uh, built maybe, oh, 80, 90 years ago, still inhabited, and the mountaintop. So any kind of farming or gardening that you do in Appalachia is usually either going uphill or downhill, and uh, rare to find a, a flat spot. So this is kind of a unique. It's not completely flat, but it's, it, it is workable. So let me, let me also give you some history of some of the tools. That's mainly what our workshop is about today. Um, the right tool for the right job. So let me put that into a historical context for you. Come on over here. So these are some of the early tools that the settlers were very dependent upon. For example, um, this is called a, a hewing axe. So when they would cut trees, they would shave them square on all four corners. That made their floorboards and their floor beams, and also built the beams they used for building log cabins. This is the, when they had a log that was hewed, ready to go, they would use this tool. That's, a, that's an auger, and that tool was used to make holes where they could grab onto it with these timber tongs right here. So you could grab the log and pull it, to where you would further work on it. And of course, as we know, this whole area, much of the economy was based upon coal mining and steel. They kind of go together. And this is a coal mining auger and hand drill, basically. In those days, there wasn't sophisticated technology to get the coal out. So they would find it kind of sticking out on the side of a mountain somewhere. And they would use this to auger into the coal, which is soft, set a dynamite charge, and then run. After exploding it, then they would come back and harvest the coal. These are tools that, uh, antique tools that I have found at various flea markets. And to give you an idea of the quality of them, uh, these are used for different types of weeding. You can see the unique shapes of them according to the configuration of your beds, where the rows are planted, and how to get in there delicately and undercut the weeds before they get up and growing. You'll notice that the handles are darkened, and that's because they were well cared for using linseed oil. So I would highly recommend that if you want perpetuity in your gardening, take care of your tools. And the way to do that is with linseed oil and a rag, very simple, it's not toxic to what, what, uh, whatsoever. This, this is a tool here that, for example, you can see by the blonde bleached out color of it, that it's not long for this world. It's just a question of time before this, the oils and the wood here dry out and it cracks. And also, if you leave tools in the rain, what happens is that water seeps down through this collar here and eventually keeps this area uh, constantly wet 
bacteria and mycelium form and one day when you go out to use it in the garden it breaks in half right at that spot so please keep your tools out of the weather keep them oiled nicely and they'll do you fine service here's another tool that uh, is important for fencing in your garden this is called a it's called a t-post puller T-posts are these T-shaped steel posts. You've probably seen them a lot, a lot. A lot. This is a big one. It's an eight-footer, and we have a pounder. It's just a, nothing but a, a tube that goes over and pounds it into the ground. When you want to take it out, though, to move the garden or whatever, this is called a T-post puller, which acts as a cantilever, which just pulls it out of the ground. Pretty simple, but vital tool. Yep. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is putting a garden in when you're starting with just sod, which is the case in most backyards. And we kind of typically think there's really two ways that we think about turning the soil over to kill the grass. One is using a shovel, which is a lot of work. It means you have to dig in three or four thrusts with a shovel. Up, flip over, and then move on. Either go backwards or each side, do that again. that's completely doable but there's actually uh, from a perspective of how people do that problem solve that problem around the world I'll show you another tool that's also quite useful this in English is called a grub hole you see it and you notice the handle is very short there's a good reason for that because with this tool Instead of using a lot of upper body strength, bending and flipping and readjusting so that the soil is actually turned over, this tool is used a little differently. And that is villagers in India, China, Korea, Japan, Africa. This is like their, this is their shelf, basically. The way it works is that they dig in, they pull back. They use their whole body as a, as a lever, fulcrum, like that, and they just pull back using their weight as a counterweight. Like so. So this, has, this goes by many names in different countries, but in America, uh, it's called the grub hole. The thing is, you have to find one that's actually can be sharpened because it's made with really good steel. Really good steel means that the process by which they make this is drop forging. It's not stamped. Most of the tools you buy at the big box stores are just stamped out and then stuck into a wooden handle. And they don't last long. They're very difficult to sharpen. They wear out quickly. And the weight of them is such that you can't get a lot of work done. But listen to this. This is steel. That's a real, that's a real tool. So uh, you can find these. They're made, actually, this one's made in Austria. And, okay, let's go to um, ways to the, the other option, I'm sorry, for turning a garden over is to use a tiller. Let's go over to the tiller. Okay, most people think that the easy way to put a garden is, is to rototiller. Technically, yes, it does churn up the sod. And it, it doesn't really bury it, though. It just kind of leaves it on the surface. 
not only is that a problem, but the other thing is that in the process of the the tines mixing things up a little bit, your real helpers in the soil are the macro and the micro organisms that live in the soil. They are making channels for water to and so this is kind of like putting them in a blender and uh, it, it sets them way back in terms of their populations. Actually, they're the real farmers. They're the ones really doing the work. The other problem with it is that if you till in soil that's a little bit wet, you knock the lungs out of the soil. I'll give you an example of that. Basically, here's the test for knowing if you should be till, uh, tilling, shoveling, or using a grub hoe or anything. That is, when you take a ball of dirt, if you can't easily break it with your thumb, or another way to test that is to hold it shoulder length and drop it. If it doesn't want to break up immediately, it's too wet. It should generally not be in there. Again, the problem with being in there is that you, you are... Uh, depopulating the soil microorganisms because like us they need air and by compacting the soil uh, you create an environment that doesn't allow them to repopulate and you make it hard on yourself if the soil when the sun comes out and begins getting hot dries out and becomes like peanut brittle it's just just hard to work with so when it's wet stay off your garden okay let's move on to the next thing Okay, the next thing I want to do is familiarize you with some of the basic tools, some of which you may not know exactly what they're used for. This, of course, obviously is a shovel, right? Everybody can have access to a shovel. But this is what's called a transfer shovel, which is really meant for moving materials, from scooping and moving materials, not so much as a digging tool. By comparison, let's go down here. This is a, that's a digging shovel, but it's meant for squaring things off as compared to a spade. Spades are pointed, where these kind of digging shovels are meant for edging, or when you've got very loose soil, you're taking sod out like that towards the end. These are really handy. They can keep a nice square edge. Likewise, these two are called trenching shovels. You see by the, the curve in them, what they're really meant for is when you're digging a shallow trench. Although, quite honestly, I kind of use this as my favorite weeding tool. I sometimes cut the handles off, and I found this uh, by scooting around on the ground, which you'll see in a minute over here. They're really nice for weeding. And they're heavy and they're light enough to get underneath the root systems, but heavy enough to really do right along here. This, of course, is a pitchfork. The sister tool to this is called a silage rake. And it's the same thing, but it's, it has slightly more curved tines on it, and it's meant for pulling things off the wagon, not having so much body strength. Pitchforks are exactly what they're called, they're used for how they're called, and that is they're used for pitching things up or pitching things off. This is a harvesting fork for potatoes, carrots, things like that, where you're trying carefully not to hit your crop, but still loosen it so you can get your hands in there and dig everything out. And this is a manure fork. It's flattened on the tines on the backside, and it's really meant for in either on the ground or where you have cement, like where you're milking cows, and you can easily slide it like that without the manure falling out of it. Whereas these other tools, you can't do that. This is kind of the most common of uh, cultivating tools, a hoe. But I'm going to show you how a hoe is used on this other patch of dirt over here. 
This is an arrowhead hoe, I call, which is really, really good for certain kinds of weeding, which I'll show you in just a second. Okay, let's move over there. So thus far, we've shown you basically tools for working from the very beginning, so how to flip your soil, various tools that are used for that. Now I want to show you a couple of really wonderful tools that aren't common in most garages or backyards that are used in soils like we have now at Farm 18 where we've worked this soil for years. We've added tons of organic materials to it. It's soft and it's got a nice tilt. So instead of having to use a shovel, for example, the soil, we can do bite off bigger chunks of that cultivating task. For example, this is called a broad fork. See it has one, two, three, four, five, five, uh, Prongs at a slight curve, two handles, and the way it works is to step into your soil. That's you see, this is excellent soil here. Just step on it and loosen. Step on it and loosen. So, what we're doing by doing that is the soil but gently we're just stirring it basically we're not trying to bring subsoil up we're just trying to loosen it and in so doing we're aerating it letting it the microorganisms the algae the fungi the bacteria all beneficial that live in there to get air and to multiply so that's a wonderful tool it's called the broad fork here's another one so this is a tool made in Italy I call it just simply the Italian cultivating tool. It does the same work as a broad fork, but it's a little more specific in the area that you're you're loosening and stirring the soil. The other feature of it that I really like is that the length of the handle uh, gives you lots of leverage. Most tool handles, if they're fit for your body, come up to about your chin. So you dig and you just pick up. Dig up with it like that. See, it does a beautiful job of stirring that soil. So if you get, if you're eager to plant really early, actually one of the workshops that we teach towards the end of the, the growing season is called the early, early, really early garden. And in that workshop, we show you how to prep your garden in the fall so that in the springtime, like these kind of days where it's 50 degrees out and not too wet, you can actually plant. You could be out here planting right now things that are cold loving crops like spinach, lettuce, chard, broccoli, kale, collards, all those kind of things like this kind of weather. They actually do better in this kind of weather. And the advantage to doing it early, we're still in what, March 24th today is that you beat the weeds. In other words, the weeds haven't really kicked in until about the second week in April. So you got to jump on them. And if you're doing market gardening, not just some backyard gardening, but in market gardening, timing is everything. In terms of pr producing, uh, planting a sequence of the next crop like that. So getting an early start is a big part of successful market gardening. Okay, then, of course, when this soil is loosened like that and aerated, I usually just come and break it up a little bit after it's been nice and dried out. And then, of course, standard rake is to rake it out. Now that's ready to plant. Okay, so we're, uh, let's move on to our next subject, which is transplants. How do we transplant? The next area we want to talk about is now that you've got a nice uh, deep tilt bed that's smooth. Uh, smooth is very important, especially if you're direct seeding, because if you if it's on an angle, it gets rained on hard. Water washes the seed downhill, and what happens is you don't get even germination. You thought you were going to have 
10 or 15 lettuce plants coming up here and you've got four because you didn't take the time to use your rake and other cultivation tools to really get everything as level and smooth as you can. What we're going to show you now though is not direct seeding, it's transplanting. So I have a few flower plants here and some oregano. Um, in transplanting, you always want to be very careful in removing the transplant from this, in case it's a, a cell pack with four cells in it. And you don't want to tug on it, you want to push it a little from the bottom and ease it out. Ease it, just ease it out. Then you want to look and see what's the condition of these roots. In this case, this is becoming root bound. You don't want to plant it like that. You want to pull these threads like this so that it's got a fresh start in that new hole that it's going to be living in. Something like that. The other issue with this plant is it's dry. This should, the moisture level of these, these uh, blocks of soil should be just so you can squeeze them and a little bit of water comes out. Don't plant dry. And then, of course, when you put it in the hole, you want to make your hole, I always try to think of it as a mason jar. In other words, you're not digging, you're not digging V shapes just out of expediency. You want to dig something so that when that's round enough and flat at the bottom enough so that when these roots finally take hold, they've got a friendly area to grow in. They're not pressing against a hardened side that you smeared and putting your trowel in. Okay, so let me show you that technique. So I'm loosening. I'm thinking of a, the size of a mason jar. Once I've got that nice and loose, take my hand like that, and I just pull that soil aside, hold it along the side, put this in with plenty of space on both sides. I bring that soil back around like so. And then I don't, don't press it too hard, because again, you don't want to upset that root system. But you do want it to be firm enough. One of the huge mistakes I've seen made many, many times is that people transplant too shallow. I've actually seen situations where they take the plant out. They just kind of dig a fast hole and they just kind of stick it in. And what happens to this is if you get three days in a row of hot weather, like right now it's breezy, but there's cloud cover, it's not too bad. This plant is suffering like anything. It wants to be firm and deep enough so that you've created uh, a well around it so that when it does rain, the water wants to puddle there and stay in, the, in that rhizosphere, into that root zone, okay? So again, don't plant shallow. So let's fix this guy. Again, I made a nice jar-shaped hole, like a mason jar. Brought the soil around. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Huh? Yeah. Don't that. that. Cool. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay, so let's do some oregano now. Yeah, you're curious, aren't you? All right. So this is—is uh, is that rosemary or? Rosemary, okay, I'm sorry, rosemary. Now that's a bigger plant, so I'm gonna make a little bit bigger hole. Of course, you might not wanna plant these. That's a brick. This used to be houses here. <laughs> okay, so I made my, I've made my nice, loose area. I'm sticking my, my paw in there and I'm pulling it back so it's even on all sides. Then again, Turning this on its side, flip it over, push a little from the bottom, and gently, very gently pull. See here? That's root bound. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna pull some of these roots out, straighten them out a little bit, take some of them away. I, I usually throw them back in the hole. And you're not hurting the plant by doing this. Believe me, you're doing it a favor because it's uh, been in that pot too long.
okay? Again, nice holes that can easily spread out once the roots start up again. Then I tuck it in, pinch it in, not too hard, but firm. And I create a well around it so that it's going to hold water. All right, and a couple more here. This is oregano. This one's good and wet, not root bound. So again, a nice loose hole. Pull it back. Put it in. Bring that dirt back around and tuck it in. And then make a well around it. All right, we only got what, two more, one more plant. And then we're going to show you a little cultivating. This is also sweet mint, huh? Of course, in real life, you wouldn't want to plant all these together because the mint will spread. And unless you want a permanent mint bed, you would probably plant the mint separate, segregate it somewhere else in the garden where it can spread, but not take over your flower garden. That should have been a little more wet. Again, I'm loosening. And I feel like I've got a nice even shaped hole. I pull it aside. When I say pull it aside, I mean just bunch it up on one side, just like that. The reason I say that is I see some people that do holes like this. <laughs> they throw the dirt like all over the place. And then they put the plant in too shallow and they just kind of roughly bring the soil back. It might survive, it might make it, depending on weather conditions. But this is a much better way to do it. Okay, here goes the mint plant. It's going in. I'm bringing the dirt around evenly on all sides. I'm pressing down, but not too hard. And again, creating a bowl or well around it. Okay. All right, we're going to move on and show you some cultivating techniques. Okay, so we got these planted, these grass plants, or it might be uh, little lettuce plants, little lettuce plants, or, or spinach plants that are just coming up. So how do we cultivate them? So in the world of organic farming and gardening, there's a saying about weeds that if you can see them, it's too late. And what that means generally is that once they're up and have more true leaves on them, yeah, you technically you can knock them down, but it's a it's a warfare the whole summer long dealing with it. So what we want you to learn is how to how do we prevent it from leaving? And there's there are some really wonderful tools for doing that. I didn't bring all of them with me, but this is your standard hoe, right? Made in China. The metal that this is made from may have come from Wheeling, from the Benwood McMeckin scrap yard where they turn it up into scrap into scrap metal put it on a boat and take it to China and they make these tools that are very cheap. However, they work. This is all you have. And in using a hole, people just kind of use the broad end of it right here, flat end, in a chopping motion, which has problems because one, they're, they're, they're not sharp, they're hard to keep sharp. So what I would suggest to you is use the corner right here. That's why you see old farmers and they have hose and the hose are rounded off in the corners because that's what they did. That's how they used it. So in that case, you do like this. And it works. You want to be careful not to disturb those root systems, but, but get as close as you can. And that not only is get the red like weeds out preventatively, but it also aerates those roots. Superior to this, though, it's a tool that I've been using for years, with you, is this cultivating tool that has an arrowhead shape to it. Which, by the way, for those of you who are part of the backyard gardeners, uh, this is what we gave you. It's a really good tool. It is fiberglass. I prefer wood. Fiberglass is okay. Keep it out of the sun because, in due course of time, UV damage will get this. Eventually that UV damage will splinter it and you'll get fiberglass splinters in your hand. So even though, yeah, it doesn't rust and it's light, it will go bad if you keep it uh, out in the open, especially in the open. Sun. 
So this is basically like using the corner of a hole, that type of hole, but it's a lot easier. You don't have to keep remembering to turn the hole. And it also has the function of you can drag the soil up around your plants to kill them, which is called dust mulching. I used to do like whole uh, half acre gardens with just this preventatively. It would take a few hours, but I knew that I was good after using this because of the, the reach that it has and the uh, action that it has. I didn't have to think about weeds again for 10 days to two weeks. So that's really the success of weeding is thinking of it preventatively. Don't let them get going on you because probably the single most reason people get discouraged in their backyard gardens, they get taken over by weeds uh, or the insects get them. Which reminds me, we have another workshop we're going to show you called uh, Insects Beware. Uh, we're not taking it anymore and we know where you live. That workshop's coming up uh, sometime in, I think, July or August sometime. Okay, anything else? If not, thank you very much for your kind attention and good luck in your gardening. Take care.